I'm Ola, and I'm at Villa de Bank, and this is Art Savari. In Art Savari, we cut our way through the jungle of contemporary culture, and today we're taken on that journey by Thijs Svaning. Thijs and I met at the Musical Conservatory of Amsterdam over 10 years ago, and each of us have taken different paths since then. Now, as we reunite, we engage in a conversation about the darker side of the artistic mind, creativity, and how it can weigh heavily on life. You know, this what is that super chat? It's when you have like a, a live chat room of um, YouTube, and people can just chat. Oh, okay. And then, and but the super chats is when people actually pay money, and that's what they, where they kind of draw the line very often when they say, mm-hmm. okay, if you pay a certain amount of money, then we read your questions. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that I want to get to that stage where people pay us money to read their questions, but we, I would really like to have that direct connection with the, with an audience that yeah. you know contributes. So why don't we invite some people from the streets over to this <laughs> table? <laughs> uh, for one, it's a corona pandemic. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I got my vaccine last week. Yeah, well, we no. didn't. <laughs> okay. Well, you got a vaccine now. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm protected against this lethal virus which is going to kill all people on earth (laughs) yeah right yeah Yeah. (laughs) but you got it because um you're considered to be a vulnerable group yeah (laughs) yeah yeah they put me in this category of retarded people (laughs) oh god are you joking that was uh the people with uh mental uh difficulties yeah the, the mentally challenged uh, also known as special people, <laughs> <laughs> came in first for the vaccine. Is it true? It's true. Wow. And, uh, they put me in the wrong category, you know, but uh, yeah, I was lucky. So uh, I said, yeah, give me the vaccine. Yeah. Why not? So and you didn't get the vaccine that cluts up your blood? No. Well, I was kind of knocked out for three days. Three but, days? Uh, yeah, but I needed some sleep anyway. So yeah. Uh, yeah. That's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. 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 What's Wh- it? When Wh- are you getting your vaccine? I've no clue. I okay. don't think I will get it. No. No, it will oh. last another year before I get the opportunity oh, okay. to get the vaccine. Hmm. I'm like the last one on the bottom. You're healthy, good looking. Yeah, to a certain young. extent. Um. <laughs> 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 young. <laughs> no, but I think like uh, I often joke about this. As, uh, you know, I'm in the cultural sector, and in my government, it's not very culturally friendly, and so. You know, I always joke that I'm like on the lower class <laughs> society. Yeah. So they, I think they'll be happy to get rid of me. <laughs> They're like, yeah, you know, d- just no. no. no but um, I don't feel very associated with the government or no. with, the, with with society, really. In that with extent. the retarded people? I mean, I, I have no problem with them. <laughs> You as long as they don't know where I live. <laughs> but now they do. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> You're staying over. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, but uh, it, in a certain way, um, I'm, I'm not so sure, like, with the whole situation, like, for example, right now with the, the vaccine, the cluts mm-hmm. up the bot lines. Did, what's this? <laughs> That was the vaccine. Oh. <laughs> 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 they, they, and then I, I really am concerned to a certain extent where I think, like, you don't know where this is going to go. You know, you don't know if in six months they realize, like, oh shit, we really fucked up, you know? And then uh, they have to recall a lot of stuff, like yeah. all the countries stopping with AstraZeneca or Faxa, any yeah, that one. AstraZeneca. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then, um, this is stuff you could basically like foresee when you're gonna rush something like like this, like medical stuff, and you're gonna yeah. get trouble down the line. And I don't, I like, I'll wait till the point. Most likely, I'll be invited like way in last in line. Mm-hmm. But even then, I'll wait till <laughs> till everyone had theirs, <laughs> and I see how many people die, and it's like, oh yeah, that's okay. Then I can take it. It's not a big risk. Yeah, it's, it's strange with this. Uh medication because usually it takes 20 years to develop something yeah and now they rushed it into this uh six months uh thing uh, with side effects and uh but you feel comfortable enough to take it 
Yeah, I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you you genuinely feel comfortable enough to take the the vaccine, knowing that it took six months to develop, whereas usually it takes forty times that time to. Well, to they they set me up. Oh, yeah. So you had no choice. I didn't want to take it. Really? And um, yeah, and this girl came into my life. <laughs> and she told me, "You gotta take it." So I took it. Really? And. Uh, I experienced this uh, needle in my arm. Um, yeah, it was quite <laughs> something. <laughs> oh man! Wow. <laughs> the needle in the arm. Yeah. No, but she was she was good looking then. Yeah, pretty good looking. Yeah. What's so her name? I'm not gonna tell you. Oh, <laughs> you're afraid that I'm gonna look her up. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out she's this not on good YouTube, looking. <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, yeah. and um, but Spotify. But she actually works for the government. Like she's like a nurse. She's from the police. What? Yeah. No. Yeah. The police came into my house. Really? Asked me this question: Do you want to take the vaccine? Yes or no? No. This is a joke. No, this is true. Really? Yeah. And. Um, yeah, I, I, I told them I don't know because uh, uh, I feel healthy. I'm quite good looking and young, and I just told them I don't want to take it. Yeah, but uh, they uh, persuaded me, uh, and right away they had this needle and they shoved it up. Th they came into your house. The police came into my house. But you opened the door. No, they smashed the window. Oh, that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> that's just, that's just, what the fuck? <laughs> no, but let's let's be really honest here. Okay. They came into your house? Or this girl comes to my house once a week to oh, talk about my life. But it's not life. the police. No, it's not oh, the police. Okay. Of course it's not the police. I don't know. Man, I I I I you could I don't know Amsterdam. You know, maybe okay. it's normal in Amsterdam that the police comes to your house cuz like yeah, every now and then. Check out what the fuck's going on yeah. here. They ask you uh, do you vacuum clean, do the dishes, <laughs> laundry oh service. No, we're talking about Amsterdam where Amsterdam. everyone votes like lefty. Like you voted for the com like the communist party. Yes, I'm a communist. <laughs> So this is like a wet dream for you, is that they come into your house and give you, <laughs> give forcefully put needles into your yeah. body. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's on your list? Uh, to talk oh, no, about? yeah, no, but just putting the list away. Oh, put yeah, the list away. Yeah, no, fuck I drew this picture for you. you yeah, I know. Threw it away. You made a really nice picture for me. Yeah. Thank you very much. Heart. No. Yeah, I'm going to put it's it in the... Kind of the way I perceive you. <laughs> your your <laughs> presence. My presence. Is, it's like that. I don't, I don't understand. No. Like, it, it has a very, very coarse lines around that. I don't know what to make of this. Or okay. is that a window? Is that a, a window or... A, it looks like broken glass. <laughs> it's like the red light district. <laughs> what? Can you show it for the camera? Uh, show yeah, it. Yeah, here. Look. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll make a picture on the in the in the video. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well. 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 This well. This is us. This is us. But no, here but we are live. Live in the studio in New York. <laughs> Gonna get myself some water. No, but. Um, I'm, I'm Is that vodka? No. Oh. <laughs> you want some water? Here you go. Thank there you. you are. Now. Okay. You have donuts? I'm, I want to know everything about N.A. N.A. Tell me all about it. Well, N.A. Because um, you, you used to go to meetings of yes, the N.A. Often. Um, how, how often did you go there? Well, I found out about NA about seven years ago when I tried to get clean and couldn't do it. And um, I walked into these uh, so-called rooms um, where people gather yeah. to uh, stay clean and support each other in this uh, journey. Um, basically, uh, 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 NA is something that should not be talked about or... It's like uh, Fight Club. It's it is like Fight Club. 
And, uh, oh I cannot tell you who I uh, met there or what we talked about. Um, but basically, it's, uh, it's a group of people uh, with the same problem and uh, without any solutions. Uh, mm. So it's, um, as they say in drug use and active addiction, there's three choices, jails, institutions, or death. That's quite serious. That's quite serious. But what's the alternative for staying clean? Uh, freedom, health, and uh, yeah. Money. Money? <laughs> you save a lot of money. <laughs> Go, do, I want to remind you to keep the microphone a bit like this, like a, a fist from your mouth. So you like keep a fist from my mouth. Yeah, you can put a fist oh. in between like this. Okay. Yeah, but if you put it like this and you talk over the microphone, so okay. put it a bit like that. They put it like talk this. into it. Into the microphone. You see, you, you see what oh, I mean? Here, let me help you out. <laughs> Here. Bit like, bit like that. Oh, okay. You turn this. Up. There we are. Yes. Like that. Yeah. Okay. And then a bit more towards your face. There. <laughs> <laughs> no, but else, else we can't hear what you're saying. Oh, okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. No, but so um, seven years ago, you were introduced to NA. Yeah. Uh, how how did this go? Like, what what's the procedure that you went through? Um, well, I vaguely heard about these kind of meetings alcoholics anonymous uh friend, that, yeah that's right friend. that's the same as a 12-step program um i knew someone who went to narcotics anonymous but uh i never thought this was an option to go to until my psychiatrist recommended me to go to one of these meetings and no. there was a website with uh schedule of meetings and there was one that night I went to and um, yeah it was strange because um, um, there was an introduction of the meeting by the by the chairman and the, one of the first things he said was the newcomer is the most important person at any meeting I was the newcomer when I came in uh, that meeting, people said, hello, welcome, good to see you, and at the end, uh, keep coming back, uh, good you were here. Um, so I, I kind of felt uh, at home and welcomed mm -hmm. and um, comfortable to go to more of these meetings. And I live in Amsterdam, and there's at least six NA meetings a day. Really? A lot, yeah. This is just Narcotics Anonymous. Wow. There are other fellowships as well for sex and gambling and eating. And uh, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a drug meetings uh, more than enough a day. Um, yeah. What do you think? <laughs> no, um, yeah. Go I, to I one think of these six meetings. Uh, I would like to go yeah. at one point to see what it's like, but I, I don't know. Like I, I don't have the N A problem, like the narcotics problem. So maybe we like wrong to go to yeah. to like the it would be collect tourism. There are different meetings, uh, open meetings and closed meetings. And open meetings are open for visitors. All right. Yeah. So they can uh, see what's going on and. Uh, do you get a lot of visitors to those open meetings? Not really, uh, no. Um, it's mostly the same group of people. I think in my hometown, there's got to be like two, three hundred fellows, they call them, the people who come to the meetings, mm. the addicts. We call each other, used to call each other fellows. Um, so you kind of get to know most of them uh, throughout the time. And um, not a lot of visitors, but that's also because they don't advertise themselves. Okay, it's yeah. not on TV or radio. No, well, yeah, it um, seems reasonable to me that they don't put it on. No, they they don't want you to promote this method. Mm -hmm. um, it's based on attraction, not promotion. That's mm. what that's one of the traditions or principles, or I don't know how they call it anymore um, so it would be like uh, for example you 
are in this uh, drug hell, and I would attract you to come to one of the meetings, but I would not say in a group of people, um, anyone who has a drug problem come to the mm, meeting. Mm. It's very personal. Okay, yeah. Um, most people come to the meetings because they went to 12-step clinics, rehabilitation centers. Um, in there they get to know this program and the counselors recommend them to go to meetings mm. to find a sponsor, some like a mentor, someone who's been clean longer and tell you how to uh, how to um, go about life in, um, without using drugs. Um, for me, it was different. I didn't go to a rehab first. I came into the meetings first. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, but uh, in all these years, seven, seven years of meetings, including two uh, rehabilitation centers to clinics I went to, uh, I never managed to stay clean for longer than, what was it, five months. Mm. Usually I would relapse after three weeks, four weeks, uh, seven years of 12 steps more I was in more more in drug use than sobriety wow yeah so um, now I've come to the point that um, the things I learned in in uh, the meetings I still use in daily life such things like keep it simple uh, one day at a time or whatever the one liners the cliches but now i've come to the conclusion okay so all i need to do is stay clean and the rest will follow mm -hmm. and the stuff they teach you in the meetings or preach about uh is just total brainwash yeah because I, I i heard you talk about this mm -hmm. uh, a couple of times before is that you know, there are some elements that are very like, useful for your personal development mm -hmm. and your rehabilitation or uh, like getting out of the trap, or the jail. I don't know how you would describe it yourself. Well, the, I think the, the greatest thing about this, this self-help group is that you can connect with people again. Uh, a lot of people end up in isolation after mm -hmm. years of drug abuse. Um, myself, I ended up in my house, um, basically in bed or on the couch using drugs. At a certain point, I didn't even turn the TV on anymore. My phone was always switched off. Uh, I didn't open the door for anyone besides drug dealers and uh, uh, takeout pizzas. So uh, it's a pretty lonely. And um, I guess in the beginning, for most people, the connection with other recovering addicts is, is the most valuable part of this program. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, I was lucky uh, because my family always stayed in touch with me. Uh, most of my friends uh, stuck around. They didn't give up on me. They didn't abandon me or alienate me. So. Uh, and and I live in this community. I've I, I, got, I have my own house, but around in this this little neighborhood, there's more people like me who have a little bit of trouble uh, with everyday life, and uh, we get together. Yeah, we have this. Uh, there's this common space where we eat together and uh, hang out. Um, so I always maintain this kind of network around me. The people never really gave up on me, um, and uh, me in, uh, in drug use. Usually, I didn't fight with anyone. No, no fights. No. Uh, yeah, of course, I hurt people's feelings by not being around, but I never got into uh, fucked up shit. Um, I always, I, I just stayed in my house. I didn't go to bars to pick fights, uh, mm -hmm. no crim crime, nothing to do with crime. I didn't steal. 
uh, I didn't treat anyone bad, uh, but uh, I neglected. I neglected everything. Yeah. Uh, the the social part of life neglected it completely. Um, and that was nice about uh, the meetings because uh, the first time I walked in, I got this book and uh, at the, the last page of the book had a um, list of phone numbers with uh, people from that meeting. Mm, from the very, like the, the room that were in the room with you at that time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, they wrote down their names and uh, phone numbers. So I, I would call them every now and then. Um, and basically they told me to go to more meetings uh, as they there is this 9090 thing they talk about uh, 90 meetings in 90 days at the beginning of your uh, of of the recovery and uh, i think i did something like that but i never i didn't manage to stay clean for 90 mm. days but you went to 90 meetings in 90 days yeah yeah wow. pretty much pretty much and at first when i came in the rooms i wasn't really clean yet i would use a little bit of alcohol and uh, cannabis every night and there is a condition for sharing at a meeting uh, the condition is uh, you clean for 24 hours uh, in order to share something with the group and i was the first 10 days i wasn't clean because I would use a little bit of drugs uh, every night. And uh, then um, I did, I stopped, basically I stopped using drugs um, when I came to the meetings because I wanted to share something. I wanted to talk in mm -hmm. the group. That was the motivation for me to stay clean that first night. And so I did. And... Um, yeah. How, how how long were you using drugs up to that point when you decided to share, to stop using just so you could share? Basically from the start to the end, to, the, to that moment? From the moment I first walked into... No, from, like from w when did you start up to that point that you decided to stop? Yeah. How long is that period? That's... That was a long time. Um, I think I started using drugs at a daily basis from the age of 18, drinking, smoking joints. Um, pretty soon after I finished my high school, uh, I started working, renting bikes to tourists, mm -hmm. to Mac bike. Um, and there was this kind of... Uh, yeah, Dr little drug scene going on. Not a drug scene, but chilling out after work, oh, yeah. drinking beer, smoking joints. And that appealed to me. And uh, I just joined these people. And uh, yeah, I liked it at first. Um, sort of made my problems go away. And my feelings, my feelings, my thoughts, my anxieties to... Uh, to a more manageable level. Um, so, yeah, um, that was at the age of 18. And sometimes I would stop, especially with the cannabis. It would be, it was very easy for me back then. Just stop now and would begin after a few months again. Um, uh, but it came to a problem. I think I recognize recognized I had a problem at the age of 22. So um, three, three, four years of successful drug use uh, without any real issues. No. Uh, but then, um, yeah, kind of a uh, few things came together in my life. Uh, I got my own place. Um, friend of mine went on a holiday and I could use his house for a few months. Uh, I started studying uh, and working at the same time. Um, and yeah, using more drugs, losing my 
uh, daily routines in sleeping and eating and um, basically uh, I got more anxious, more paranoid. Um, well, was it because of the situation that you were in at the time or was it because of the drug use that you became more anxious? It was because um, I think I wasn't used to this kind of freedom mm. in my life. I could get up at whatever time I wanted to uh, uh, go out or not go out at all, watch movies all day. There were no, there was no one telling me to get out of bed or to come to dinner, or to go go get out, go out of the house. So I started smoking joints uh, as soon as I woke up mm. early in the morning. Wake and bake. Wake and bake. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's some heavy shit, man. Wow. Pretty heavy. Before breakfast, before coffee. Uh, Smoking these fat ass joints and um, um, and that fucked me up pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, didn't take long. Um, and um, yeah, I sort of knew something was wrong in my mind, especially after a few uh, trips on LSD. Um, the last. The last hit I took um, days after I knew, okay, something is wrong in my mind and it's got to do something with uh, the last LSD pill mm. I took. Uh, but um, I was aware of that the first few days, first three days. After that, I forgot. And, and I got into a different world. It was... Uh, I got psychotic. Oh no! Yeah, I got psychotic. Uh, what what's what's that like? That because yeah, what is that like? Um, in the beginning, it was sort of fun. Um, I was happy. Um, a lot of energy. Um, visually, things uh, changed in my in my perception. Uh, the colors were beautiful and um, sounds were cool and uh, and I felt I felt pretty okay but the, the paranoia got worse over time um, I got uh, some sort of insomnia sleeping for two three hours a night uh, which got uh, worse less sleep uh, which led to more paranoia and more anxiety also more anger and um, um, yeah, uh, an, an unmanageable kind of brain. I didn't understand what was going on mm. in my mind. I knew something was wrong, um, but I didn't know what. And I blamed it on uh, people around me, the people I love most. Um, but pretty much I lost my sanity uh, and my parents had to intervene to uh, uh, make my sanity go b come back mm -hmm. with the use of antipsychotics. Mm. Uh, after using antipsychotics for a little while, I, uh, I could think more clearly again. I could sleep, I could manage uh, my emotions and thoughts. Um, uh, and it was triggered by drugs, this psychosis. Uh, it also runs in my family from my mother's side, these kind of mental, uh, issues. Um, but I sort of, uh, sped up the pro process yeah. by, uh, using a lot of substances. Um, so the, the drug problem, it, I was aware of that by the age of 22. Okay, I have this issue with drugs, try to stop. Um, but it took me much longer uh, to actually stop. And in the meantime, I started using different substances mm -hmm. uh, like amphetamines and cocaine and um, uh, sleeping pills. Uh, I think those three the most. And um, so kind of strange. 
I realized I have a problem. Yeah. But the the result was my addiction got out of hand more mm -hmm. by the time I found out I had a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I found it a very um, um, it's a very uh, I, I don't even know the right word so it's almost confronting to hear you know that what you have what you went through mm -hmm. it's such a heavy story um, you know I know you f from around that just before that time I think like when you were what 21 something like something this something like that so yeah. it was just before it became that problem yeah and I think we lost touch um, at some point just before that everything went wrong. Mm -hmm. And then I, we met a few times in between. But um, it's such a an intense... Because um, I, I know um, your depression and those kind of things very well. But the, the whole psychotic... Okay, I, I think at some point in my life... I have that point where I, uh, I too had an experience similar to this, like the psychotic experience, but not so intense as what you describe. You know that people had to intervene, mm -hmm. um, and with 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 drugs. For me, it, uh, you know, taking um, antidepressants took me 16 years to give in, to actually accept that I maybe I need some medication to actually get to that point of. Accepting help. Accepting uh, help, yeah. yeah. But f for you, that stage, that was that the moment that you went to the NA then, when, when you started taking antipsychotics? Or no, that was a little bit later. Um, when I uh, started taking this medication, the antipsychotic, uh, I lived with my parents. Uh, basically, I stayed in my room for about two years. Um, taking the medication and at first it got me really tired uh, sleep all day basically all I did was sleep eat and watch TV uh, on uh, lying down eating and watching um, and after about two years I got this offer for my own place mm -hmm. and as soon as I uh, moved in I wanted to change my lifestyle. I didn't want to go back to an independent lifestyle in my, in my own house, doing whatever uh, I felt like doing. No. So I wanted to change and stop using drugs. That's when I got introduced with uh, uh, Narcotics Anonymous by my psychiatrist, oh, yeah. who told me about these meetings I could go to. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, but it's yeah, uh, it's um, it's a heavy journey, man. It's a heavy journey, and um, now I'm um, 33 years old, and come to a point, uh, I tell myself every morning, uh, I'm never gonna use drugs anymore. Mm -hmm. This is different from the approach of uh, Narcotics Anonymous, which they repeat this thing, uh, stay clean, just for today. Today I stay clean, tomorrow we'll probably see. too. <laughs> we'll see, probably. Uh, but that uh, my attitude has changed. Um, for me, there's no point in ever taking drugs, or whatever kind of drugs anymore. Nothing anymore. No. So uh, I got this mantra now, I'm never going to use drugs anymore. I repeat it for 10, ti ten times. Uh, that's what you do when you wake that, up. That's what I do in the morning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and it works for me because um, my life in drug use is just so horrible and uh, isolated, depressing. It's pretty much all the negative things in life together by myself in a closed space. Um, there's no point in going back to that kind of life. No, no. Not at all. No. I mean, anything 
that could happen to me, uh, that could happen to an, any human being, any person, is still not as bad as uh, experiencing that and, and relapsing into drug abuse. It's always better clean, mm. whatever happens. So, but there's moments that it's difficult, right? That's do you, do the, you have difficult moments now still? Like, that's the funny thing. Uh, now I'm clean for about for a little bit longer than three months, and there are no difficult really? moments. This is normal to me. Uh, getting clean is easy. Um, no cravings uh, in drug use. Uh, uh, stuff around me uh, at outside it doesn't trigger me. People under the influence or seeing drug dealers or coffee shops, bars, or whatever. Um, so I talked about this with a professional, telling him I find it easy to get clean, um, no cravings, as I said. But the, the moment something horrible happens in my life, I get the craving and I start using drugs again. This is a, a pattern. Mm. Uh, easy, uh, something hard happens and I yeah. relapse. Then we talked about uh, taking some sort of medication for these for these uh, moments uh, and uh, this is still a backup I have but I uh, abused the medication uh, I, I took it for, for fun <laughs> that doesn't sound very good <laughs> no <laughs> it, oh uh, yeah sorry I'm laughing about now it, it was <laughs> <laughs> oh my word! It was Valium, mm. and um, yeah, it doesn't sound like a good thing to have in the house. No, no, no. I managed to uh, not to touch it for uh, less than a week, and mm. then I just took one of them. I had three of those pills at home, and uh, um, so that experiment kind of failed. But it was funny because taking these uh, uh, sort of tranquilizers reminded me of how I uh, th I didn't want to be, I don't want to be sedated um, they confronted me with this high or sedation whatever you want to call it not being sober uh, and and the next days as I, I told myself but I want to experience life clean mm -hmm. and sober without this filter or uh, under the influence of a substance. And maybe for me it was an extra motivation. Okay, I know I want to stay clean. I know I don't even want to use these kind of sleeping pills or sedatives. Totally clean. But you do drink coffee. Still, I drink coffee and you smoke cigarettes. I smoke a lot of cigarettes. But how, uh, so how? F because uh, um, you know, I I sometimes um, have, have this like these stress periods, mm -hmm. and then I I smoke a cigarette or like I drink a lot of coffee, and I always feel really bad about that. Like I always want to get rid of coffee and like reduce like that. That's a completely different process that I go through. You know than what you have to go through mm -hmm. or what you went through. Um, uh, so wh where for you is like the border between what you can and cannot take or like how you, because you're busy with Zen meditation as well. There, you know, smoking's like really, oh, you do smoke and it's kind of. So how do you see, because I know that you told me that when you go to a, a rehab center, mm -hmm. basically everyone smokes. Whereas everyone's always continuous like, oh, you're smoking, so really bad addiction like why don't they cut off the smoking as well they did um the second time i went to a rehab center smoking was not allowed all right everyone got nicotine patches so uh, no smoking at all no nicotine replacements just a patch and some people take took a tablet of whatever kind of nicotine uh, substance. Uh, for me, the, 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 the difference 
between mm -hmm. um, taking these kind of things like coffee or cigarettes or cookies or uh, junk food is um, the way it alters my mind. Mm -hmm. um, taking an illegal substance or alcohol, um, some kind of drug or alcohol, changes your the way of uh, the, the the mind and the mood. It it, it alters it and um, into a more pleasant way in which you're not really around anymore. Yeah, you're not okay. Present. Yeah, yeah. it you're disables your like disab perception. Right? Yeah, you're somewhere else. Cannot think clearly, and. Um, yeah, I smoke and I drink coffee and sometimes I, uh, yeah, fight myself in a uh, gray area of cross addictions. But for me, the line is uh, drinking. And what's, a, what's a cross addiction? A cross addiction is something you could get addicted to after uh, stopping your main addiction. Ah, okay. So some people get cross addictions in sports or sex or food, uh, shopping. Uh, those are common things. Because mm -hmm. um, in Narcotics Anonymous, they believe in this addicted brain, uh, a disease in the brain, a disease of addiction, which can manifest itself into just about any part of your life. Um, they talk about obsessions. People can get obsessed with uh, anything. Uh, that was one. That was one of the first questions in the twelve-step workbook. Uh, the first question was, "What does addiction mean to you?" And the second, uh, uh, "What does the word obsession mean to you?" Do you mm -hmm. have any obsession obsessions? Um, pretty much. Uh, but um, yeah, it's pretty black and white. The twelve steps, Narcotics Anonymous. Yeah, can you can you tell a bit about how, like, for example, a meet the first meeting you went through? How did it go? Like, what's like the build up of a? Can you talk about that? Mm -hmm. I can talk about. I want to talk about that. Uh, um, some people may have uh, come across the twelve the new meetings on. Uh, TV uh, in uh, movies or mm. series. Uh, I only know the meetings from Amsterdam. Yeah. Um, and the, the format is different all over the world. But the way I uh, got to know it is uh, there is uh, a chairman, someone who hosts the meeting. Uh, it's, it's pretty much the same format. They read these uh, these sheets of paper, uh, s stuff like who is an addict, what is the Narcotics Anonymous program, what are the tw 12 steps, what are the traditions. After this, people uh, get the opportunity to share. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, and the thing with sharing is, is not allowed to comment on any of the previous speakers. So you can share your own experience, yeah. but it should not uh, get into a discussion or even some something like a, a talk. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, at all. At, like there's at all. There's at never talk. No, no. Only sharing. Only sharing. I tell you my experience of uh, recovery, and then the next one does. But it's not s the stories that have nothing to do with each other. Mm. It is all uh, they call it cross sharing, no cross sharing at at all. So different experiences, and um, yeah, they they count clean time in the meetings. They talk about one day at a time, and um, there are chips for. Uh, celebration, clean time, 30 day chips, 60 days, one year, two years. And uh, they celebrate this at each meeting, uh, asking people how long they are clean for and um, uh, handing out these chips. 
Are you tapping on the floor? Yeah. Something outside. Something Sorry. Outside. Yeah, no. We have we are living we are uh, right in the middle of a big uh, park, so mm. there's kids outside being noisy. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Just, no, that's okay. So no cross sharing. No cross sharing. But that must be really difficult because you're you're sat there and maybe you have some suggestions or some tips for someone or maybe you want to like oh well, yeah but what you were saying I really recognize myself like is there ever like you have like these in the movie you have this moment where everyone goes to the to the table with the coffee and the donuts mm -hmm. there's sharing there right the people, yeah yeah it happens uh, at the end of the meeting. And people uh, gather up uh, for coffee or uh, dinner after the meeting. But during the meeting, there, is act there, there actually isn't any possibility to talk to each other. It's but shit. why is that? Do you, do you know that, what, what the reason? The reason, I, I believe, to remember is that um, uh, reacting on someone could trigger something that is not healthy for the group process. Um, but, yeah, I never really thought there was... Um, I found that the best conversations I had, the best interaction with people was before and after the meeting. Yep. And during the meeting itself, it was just a format or which, yeah, tick the box, read this, share that, donations, uh, uh, pretty much the same stuff over and over again. And I attended a lot of meetings and a lot of shares are similar and uh, come down to the same thing. And some people uh, copy stuff from the, the literature of... Uh, Narcotics Anonymous. This is not. I came to a point where um, I needed a more personal approach, yeah, yeah. and not uh, the same stuff I'd I'd heard for all these years. It it, it was a lot of the same. But yeah. you but you have a like a buddy system or like a fellow fellow system. I don't know exactly how you call this. We have like, are you matched with you matched with uh, another person from the group, right? Yeah, um, pretty much everyone from the meetings, uh, they're, they're all fellows, so uh, you're in the same position. And then there's a thing called sponsors. Sponsorship. Mm, that's sponsors. Sponsors. Yeah, uh, a sponsor is someone who uh, is clean longer than the sponsee, so sponsor, sponsee, and who. Uh, helps you to write the steps, the 12 steps of, uh, of uh, the program. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the sponsor has a sponsor. So this is a whole family that goes all the way back to the founder of uh, the 12 step program uh, sometime in the 1930s in, uh, in America. Uh, yeah. I don't know uh, enough about uh, no, but I, uh, of course, yeah. This is like it, the thing is, is you told me that it would be really difficult to get someone to join us who is actually, you know, representative of this twelve-step program because it's quite secretive. Yeah, it, it is. Um, um, for me, I don't do this twelve-step program anymore, no. and each time. You attend a meeting, uh, you're told not to talk about what happens, happens there or who you met or what the program is about. Mm -hmm. It's very secretive. Um, I used to do the same. Uh, but now, um, yeah, uh, if you want to follow these kind of traditions, it's pretty much impossible to talk about it to with someone who still does this program. Yeah. It is, I couldn't think of anyone, uh, uh, no, because they want to keep keep it inside the rooms. Yeah, yeah. What, what happens there stays there. You told me before 
uh, that one of the steps, which is, uh, you know, the acceptance of a higher power, makes it quite, can make it quite culty. Uh, like, I don't know what the 12 steps are, so I have no clue. Mm-hmm. Like, I know there's 12 steps, and I know that one of them is, like, accept that you have a problem. Yeah. And then something like, accept that there's, like, that you can do something about it. Or that's it. Yeah. No clue. That's pretty much uh, the first three steps. The first step is uh, acknowledging there is a problem. Yeah. Uh, a drug addiction which has made your life uh, unmanageable and which uh, made you feel powerless. That's pretty much the first step. And the next two steps are about uh, accepting uh, help from a higher power and finding some sort of higher power. Yeah. And um, yeah, the, the the there are twelve steps. Can, can you can you name them? Like what's what's like? Because I I have no clue what goes after step four. Right? Well, naming all of these twelve steps is pretty un is not so interesting uh, right. to me. Uh, uh, what I kind of uh, remember uh, and what um, I didn't like so much anymore was this higher power thing, yeah, yeah. Uh, which uh, comes back. Uh, a- anything you hear about the, 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 the fellows or you read about or the people share about higher power, this and that, um, yeah. I never had this kind of higher power uh, still. I don't have this. Uh, and is what it was m- one of the main reasons I stopped going to meetings uh, was this sort of uh, thing from... Uh, it's based around Christianity and uh, a c- sort of cult uh, f- founding its roots in... Christianity, but a higher power can be anything, really. It can be anything. I mean, it doesn't have to be like God or like Yahweh or this kind of Allah or what, you know. Allah, no, yeah. yeah, no, but it doesn't like it, a higher power can be basically like the Coca Cola Corporation is a higher yeah. power because it's very f- powerful and it's mm-hmm. you know it will survive you most yeah. likely. Yeah, and uh, the steps give you the possibility to find your own higher power to pick something which is caring and helpful and uh, loving whatever they say uh, so it can be anything mm. um, but yeah to me uh, talking about sponsorship my first sponsor uh, suggested me to get down on my knees and pray every morning asking for uh, a clean and sober day mm. or to help me with any problem I had in life. And yeah, my problems got solved some one way or another somehow. But then I asked myself, was this because I help, asked my higher power for help or did I find the solution myself? Mm-hmm. Or someone else helped me finding that, uh, did it have anything to do with the higher power? Um, because now you you have your own ritual where you have like this mantra of saying ten yeah. times that you, the most important thing to make so which is basically like a a prayer on its own yeah and and you kind of empower yourself through that process rather than relying on something outside of yourself yeah uh, I've come to this point in my life after the the meetings which is about uh connection and the group and a higher power and together for me now it is all about me yeah yeah there is nothing else uh, i can do in this life in my body is me no no (laughs) no yeah no yeah no but i think it's very healthy because you said that there is a need for social interaction that's why you went to the meetings and they helped you you know give a reason to you wanted to share and it gives you this this reason to to engage with sobriety but then you know for my from my perspective the the ultimate goal is to no longer need the the program or be reliant on this process and what you told me you know is that there are so many people who you know they need this 
connection. They remain in this like reliance on something outside of themselves. Like there's very often this discourse, and I don't want to get too much into to that because I don't think it's the right discussion for that. But there's this like that religion is a hell of a drug, you know. Whereas if you rely on something outside of yourself to give you happiness and stability and uh, some reason to live, uh, to me that if you can do it without that is even more powerful. Like if you can survive the world, you know, in your own merits and you give yourself the power to start every day and remain clean. And that's, that's a, I think it's a very, you know, like an achievement to aim for. Yeah. No, that, I mean, uh, it almost seems like you, you went for to the a NA meeting for seven years, but then there's a point where you say, okay, I don't need this anymore. Well, um, yeah, for me, the 12 steps are about self development and the people, uh, the people who stay in the meetings and come like addicted to the 12 steps start believing they, they hold on to these problems, to these in step four, they call it character defects or, um, making amends to people. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> I told myself i don't have these problems anymore it's over now yeah. i stopped using drugs now there are possibilities in life positive things uh can happen um bye bye problems start new life yeah um and i don't want to be reminded of all the stuff i did in when i was using drugs or um there are other things in life than uh focusing on your as they say your recovery they they, they have this mantra recovery first recovery first yeah but what's there's got to be something um besides recovery mm -hmm. yeah uh, because what do you, you want to achieve in life uh, yeah what do you want to achieve in life what do you want to achieve? <laughs> yeah, no, that, 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 yeah, no, I, I have a very, very long, <laughs> long, a hundred year plan. Right? <laughs> For me, what a, the, the thing I want to achieve in life, uh, for something that's got to do with uh, being happy with yourself and finding and uh, having people around you who make you feel good. Yeah, uh, it's basically basically about happiness and uh, accepting ac acceptance uh, of whatever comes up. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that matches the whole the, the Zen Buddhism yeah. thing as well. Yeah, is that something that 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 is that perspective something you gained from that Zen Buddhism, or is it something that led you to the Zen Buddhism? Well, I got introduced with this. Zen meditations by a friend of mine. Uh, we used to meditate together years ago, and asked me to join uh, the little Zen, the small Zen group we are in. Uh, and they talk about um, Zen is something I cannot explain, but um, pretty much uh, it comes down to it's all okay, whatever you think. It is okay. There is not a problem. Um, it's all fine. Uh, and uh, using this approach in everyday life makes life easier, uh, a lot easier. Um, not punishing yourself or, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, focusing on negative stuff. It is, uh, yeah. I'm I'm glad I found out about Zen and the meditations and the lifestyle, and um, try to practice this in uh, everyday life. Yeah, because you're. Uh, what I'm curious about is you're quite a creative individual. Like we know each other from you know music scene in Amsterdam, and uh, you're still playing guitar. Yeah, you're you're 
you know, like fiddling with pedals and these kind of things. You have a very high standard <laughs> for the sound that you're you're making. Mm-hmm. And because um, I'm curious, like, are you planning to go back and do stuff with music then? Or like, is this something that you think like maybe in the future when I, or is it not at all a thing that you're you're curious about? Now, um, for the last. For the, quite recently, uh, I want to do a lot with my life, but I don't do anything to make it happen. Mm-hmm. I want to uh, have a job in music or something else, at least make music in a band, play guitar, uh, be successful in relationships or uh, independence, uh, mental health. But I have this passive way of uh, approaching life, waiting for stuff to happen. No. Um, Which is something I want to change by hanging out with people who are more motivated about life and actually actually make decisions. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because I ended up hanging out with a group of people uh, from... um, with mental uh, mental issues who kind of fuck fuck up life big time uh or s- watching tv tv all day or a passive lifestyle and uh, yeah sort of hospitalized that's the kind of person i became became too after years of um um being unemployed, uh, okay with the, the little bit of money I got from the government, um, I thought it was okay like this. No need to work, no, no need to get up, no need to do anything in life. Uh, get a little bit of money, do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it. There, yeah, okay. <laughs> Apparently, there's a lot of people who just don't mind. They're fine with it. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a conscious decision to get to to move out of that state of mind. Yeah. Like to really. So th- it's not that passive that you say like, I'm just waiting for stuff to happen for me. You know, you are engaging with the world around you to get to that point mm-hmm. where you become more proactive or productive. Yeah. And, but it's it's a different approach that uh, maybe a bit more slow p- approach that it's slower yeah mm-hmm. and um uh, but positive stuff is happening in yeah. my life especially the people uh i gathered and the people i uh interact with uh is uh, inspiring and motivating and positive and helping uh, and yeah my the the people who uh, are more about uh, the lazy lifestyle or not doing so much, um, I kind of um, uh, ignore. But you live in in this environment yeah. where a lot of people, you know, they have a similar background. That's that's what and I mean. Um, um, there is about 35 people with the same kind of uh, history as mine uh, with uh, psychosis. And uh, um, we have this uh, common space we can come to to uh, meet each other, basically. And the mo- you, you, you live in, in your own house. Yeah. Yeah. And these are like separate buildings around in the neighborhood. So everyone has like their independence, but there's still the ability to connect with each other. Yeah, yeah. There is the, this possibility in in our common space, which uh, is not always uh, that inspiring. Uh, people hang out on the couch, uh, watch TV, or play video games, uh, um, either on drugs or clean. A lot of them drink and smoke joints. Um, so it's not it's not necessary to remain clean or to 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 actually get housing. No, no, uh, no. That no. I mean, I, I sound disappointed in a way, but it's you almost wish like there was a bit more 
necessity to to work towards what what you what we've been describing up to, or what you've been talking about up to now is this like this tr- attempt of this journey that you went through or this you know to get to that point but it's of course now I, uh, yeah uh, maybe it's no, fine like this well it's not fine uh, um uh, it is the freedom there is a freedom in the housing that is provided for us to do whatever you want as long as you pay the rent and uh, don't uh, set the house on fire <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds, it sounds reasonable. or make too much noise for <laughs> yeah, the neighbors yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you can do yeah whatever you want uh. yeah Wow. Yeah, but I mean, Amsterdam, that's a, a hell of a place to live. Yeah. Especially, you know, with the story that you have, the background that you have. It's uh, the city that most people go to to do drugs. At least, you know, like everyone's always like, oh, yeah, Amsterdam, this this tourism thing. Now, of course, you have a very quiet city with Corona and there's there's not a lot of stuff going on. And it is quiet. Uh, it's the city I grew up uh, in and... Um the city I know best, it's my hometown. Um, for drinking and drugging, uh, must be heaven on earth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, there's so many drug dealers around, uh, you can get anything within uh, 30 minutes. Uh, wow. And uh, they worked with this, uh, the dealers I used to uh, have uh, work with the WhatsApp. She basically text them okay i want one gram of this this is my address and they show up pretty quickly at the door Mm. do the transaction and that drug dealers all over Uh, but uh did did you ever get into trouble with that no never never no 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 because it seems quite you know like it could just be a cop trying to figure out like who wants to get some stuff and then show up to your door and the guy you're trying to buy some illegal drugs? Yeah. <laughs> well, that doesn't happen. The police know about my uh, drug addiction. They do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How? They just know. Ah, uh, fair enough. Because <laughs> I know the police and they know me. Oh, okay. You have you have some in, some history. Yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah. Uh, fair enough. So that's not an issue. No. No. But it's just. Um, peculiar how easy it is to get any kind of substance or in such a short period Mm. of time so quickly at your doorstep Um, but I was always glad uh, I didn't grow up in uh, South America or Asia uh, where drugs are put into this crime um, with gangs that yeah. harass you and your family and extortion uh, basically uh, it is possible to be a drug addict in Amsterdam and not having problems with the law or dealers or uh, shady people uh, you can maintain a sort of normal life yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, we were talking earlier about your endeavors in music and stuff like that, and you know you you uh, hooking up with people that are you know drag like dragging you along mm-hmm. in their uh, personal journey, like you you tag along to kind of get that agency going on and 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 building something up again, and and I, I I'm, no but I'm really curious about is what what where you want to. Where, where do you see yourself in 10 years? So now you're really in that state of like maintaining stability and mm-hmm. control. And what would 10 years from now be like? 10 years from now? Um, uh, I really don't know. Um, and I focus. Uh, well, I hope by that time uh, I have a nice girlfriend and a job. And play in a band, mm. um, work, um, yeah, so some kind of a job, and uh, um, surround myself with uh, some sort of intellectual group. 
but uh, most of all, I hope I'm still alive in 10 years. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what, what this uh, most recent uh, sobriety getting clean again. I thought, yeah, everything, everything is fine. Everything's working out sort of by itself. But when will I die? Um, I don't know. I had this thing going on for a long time. Um, now I sort of uh, uh, forgot about that thought. Uh, but uh, that thought keeps coming back. Um, but wh- where does it, mo- like, what makes you think about that so much? It makes me think about because uh, I want to live and. For such a long time, I made a mess a mess of my life mm. in isolation, uh, in drug addiction, and complete uh, uh, self destruction. Now I've come to a point in my life that I really want to make it work and do positive stuff, make something out of it, and I'm just afraid uh, it will end suddenly, all of a sudden, yeah. without. Uh, knowing um, shit's gonna hit the fan. Uh, this is n- a new, new thought for me. Um, it maybe it is because I am finally at the age of 33 happy with myself and my life. And um, yeah, when is it gonna end? Uh, well, hopefully, a very, very long time from now. Hopefully, yeah. yes, yes <laughs> I hope so. No, but I mean, yeah. there's, there's, you know, you never know, of course, but mm-hmm. you can do anything to make it last. Yeah. You, sh- you exercise a lot, you meditate, like we were talking about meditation earlier, and you know how that influences your the way of how you deal with day-to-day life. It makes and things m- more culpable and yeah. easier. And now... Uh, I'm just really happy with uh, the people in my life, friends, uh, friends, uh, people around me, also some professionals I see. Uh, basically, yeah, the loving people in my network. Yeah, you could, you're, you're very lucky. And I don't know if yeah. it's like lucky, but you're very fortunate to have the people still around because there's so many people who, who lose everything. They lose everything and... Um, yeah, sometimes I think about this, and I'm I'm not sure if it's true, but I think people who've known me for quite some years, they saw me as this person uh, uh, not being able to deal with life and emotions and feelings and sort of numbing that uh, desperation with uh, substances, uh, uh, just out of total uh, unmanageability uh, to deal with it uh, with a clean mind. And, mm-hmm. um, the people, uh, m- most of them didn't give up on me and always supported me on whatever I was doing um, in uh, periods of clean time. Uh, I'm very grateful and uh, yeah, I remind myself often it's very pleasant to have this network of people still around me and um, I can make a phone call or send a text message and uh, people reply they want to meet up yeah yeah Uh, yeah I think it's a blessing Um, um, uh, and I never wanted to do anyone any harm in all of my uh, depressions and whatever psychosis or periods of drug abuse and I think the people know they know I was doing that because I couldn't deal with life yeah. in a normal way in a conventional way well it's, it's really I, I I think it's really great that you found a way to deal with it even yeah. after so many years you know and it's it's yeah and and you and I think that you manage expectations very well because you don't do- go and dive into these, you know, maniacalic, uh, great ideas. You know, I'm going to do this, 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 this. You, you border it off very well because it's you not know, what you were talking about earlier. Is that the main focus is to 
maintain that stability and 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 um uh, you know i kn- i know from my periods that i was very depressed that i always wanted to go and build uh, afterwards i really want to go build big stuff again mm-hmm. and and i find it difficult to go slow and that you know i admire that from, from you i one of the things i admire greatly is the way of how you find it so you're so open about this process mm-hmm. and about what you've went gone through like a lot of people i can imagine would feel feel it like difficult to to open up about what happened to them i think that's got something to do with uh the way uh my parents and sister uh always supported me in whatever point in my life and everything was always discussable and oh. um yeah do you, do you have the feeling that it helped you yeah 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 it it made me to the person i am today and the way i talk to people about my issues is uh without uh, shame or guilt or regret or uh, yeah being afraid of uh of telling what really happened has got something to do with uh, the way I talk to my family about uh, problems. And, uh, and until now, I never got a negative reaction on uh, any of the things, well, the things I shared with you yeah, yeah. during this interview. Um, yeah. But I also want to come to a point in my life uh work in which i can talk about other stuff no of my, course my, no my it, now we've been talking for a very long time that about is, it that is okay um, uh in a few years i like the simple lifestyle uh i'm happy with that uh, my house and the people around me my sports my music uh making keeping myself busy uh um that's what I like, and um, yeah, I just hope to uh, achieve, uh, to make little steps in life, to develop and uh, pr- uh, progress. Uh, and as long as it happens a little bit and slowly but surely, I'm I'm pleased. And uh, I don't have these big ambitions or goals in life. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, I think that was never the case in my mind. Uh, in my mind, I just want to be happy. That is maybe the main goal in life mm-hmm. and being happy with myself and some nice people around me is m- m- yeah, must, maybe it's the only thing I really pursue. But it, uh, what I find fascinating because um, you were talking about this before about how you were um almost like reconnecting or connecting uh with your jewish heritage as well Mm -hmm. and how that plays a role in also that process of leaving you know the past behind i have no idea about you know jewish heritage Mm -hmm. or what it's like to be jewish or even like you talked about a few things but uh, like um what role does that play for you because you you're not a practicing religious individual, but for me, uh, that part of my life and identity uh, is the m- most difficult topic to uh, to talk about. Usually, when I start talking for a little while, I just stop because I yeah. just don't know what to say anymore. All I know is. Uh, uh, from the start I've known that I'm Jewish I know I'm Jewish and I always knew this is not something you uh, advertise yourself with uh, don't um, uh, it's not something uh, to uh, just brag about or tell people all the time Uh, yeah um, it's a difficult I, I wish I could talk about it more but the words just don't come no but it's okay like I'm, i don't yeah. want to put you in a position where you I have to talk about stuff that you don't want to talk I about want to talk you can't about talk it. about it then that's okay you know but yeah but for my 
um, like you, I, I remember you saying that you went to the synagogue, and you know, and oh, what was it that you were looking for? For me, mm. I'm that that I can um, answer. I'm looking for uh, other Jewish people, uh, especially of my age, uh, to uh, share experiences with or feelings or whatever. Uh, I'm 33 and. Uh, uh, in a third uh, generation of uh, Second World War uh, victims. And yeah, I don't have a lot of people to talk to about this. Uh, I'm just hoping to find a connection because um, I feel Jewish and sometimes when I look, look this up, uh, maybe on Google uh, about... Uh, kind of traumas in families, people in my generation. I can really relate to it. <laughs> um, so basically, wish to have more people to talk about it. Um, sometimes when I try to explain these issues I have in my mind about the Jewish identity, uh, people look at me or, yeah, they don't even ask anymore. Uh, sometimes can get really dark or negative how what do you mean by dark dark yeah well i'm afraid of uh, another world war or trying to exterminate uh, jewish uh, people and uh, uh, sometimes i tell people i prepare myself for another war uh, that's why i exercise a lot or want to uh, to uh, some sort of way to defend myself also with weapons and uh, security. Um, but you really think that we'll get to that stage again? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, I have this feeling uh, I, I need to be prepared for mm -hmm. when that moment comes. Yeah. Um, well, it's, that sounds really serious. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it, because I never... I, I never knew this about you that you were so like concerned with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was afraid. Uh, sometimes uh, I watch the news or news channels, and um, in Amsterdam, ten years ago, being Jewish was not that much of an issue. But recently, the past few years, there's more anti-Semitism uh, from yeah different groups uh, it's not a particular group uh, but there's more hatred towards the Jewish community and um, I feel this and sometimes I get scared uh, but you, you get encounters with it as well I don't get encounters okay. no but just pick it up uh, mm -hmm. on um, what people talk about or um, the feelings they have um, that there is hate towards uh, yeah this community and what, where do you think that it comes from because you said that it increased like yeah. I remember being in Amsterdam 10 years ago and, and, and like I'm not Jewish but I, I never really sensed something like that being around as much but I can imagine that now uh, there might be stronger but where does it come from? Like, wh what's the source of this development? I don't know. Um, I don't know a lot about uh, Jewish history or the anti-Semitism throughout the years, but it's always been around. Uh, I don't know if I'm right, but I think from the beginning of this group of people, they were hated mm -hmm. and uh, tried to exterminate or move away from countries or move them around. Uh, um, so it's always, as far as I know, and uh, then again, I don't know if I'm right, but I get this feeling that um, some people in the world don't want the Jewish people around. Um, they want to get rid of them because, because of, uh, yeah, uh, stuff that's not right, um, prejudice, prejudice was the word I was trying to find. Uh, 
But what what's your opinion about like um uh what's your perspective on Israel then? Because there is like a large conglomerate of Jews that live in Israel yeah. that like kind of almost make like an isolated reality for themselves in the country there. Israel, mm. oh, I'm very neutral about. I just think there's got to come a solution for uh, both parties that live there, the Palestinians and the Israelis, um, to yeah, find a way to, I don't know, uh, divide this land or uh, to live together. Uh, I think it's going to be impossible. Uh, but uh, yeah, there are a lot of nations and people around the world that don't have a set location and then divide these continents with straight borders mm -hmm. and the, yeah it doesn't work um, yeah but i mean like would it be a place that you you'd uh, be interested to to go like have you ever been there once uh, once yeah yeah well i know um uh, sometimes it's funny uh I tell myself, okay, I, I'll go to Israel until I found a Jewish wife. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I tell this to myself or to my friends. Um, uh, so that's what I say, go there to find a girlfriend or a wife. But also, uh, in the back of my mind, go to Israel when um, the real war starts. Mm -hmm. um, right-wing uh, racist uh, fascist war there's gonna I believe there's gonna come something within the next 10 15 years that's really soon it's soon uh, yeah I believe uh, the whole world's gonna collapse in a way that's gonna affect everyone um, there is just too many tensions around yeah that's true the, something's got to happen and um, yeah and I think um, I'll be in Israel I hope I'll be there before uh, shit hits the van in, in, <laughs> in here in this country yeah but how do you look at corona then because that is a, a quite of a global situation you know like it, mm -hmm. we're not living in a, in a very stable environment now with the lockdowns and the insecurities and like wouldn't this be the time to say okay well just to be sure i'm gonna make my move or like i know i'm I'm trying to figure out where's like the boundary when is when you decide okay well now i have to leave or like you know it's mm. well i don't have a plan yet <laughs> it's <laughs> just something i tell myself uh, <coughs> based on my fears yeah oh, it's more like a reinsurance yeah yeah okay yeah and this corona thing um i think is a uh, good for mankind and uh, the world, the the inhabitants of the world are reminded of the fact that uh, they cause problems to the nature and uh, environment, and people have to die. Um, old, to f to old, fix it, old people and fat <laughs> people. Yeah, <laughs> that they sounds very die. harsh. Yeah, but this, this is the way of the the nature. Uh, saying uh, stop yeah stop stop getting so old and sick and not bene benefiting being beneficial to anything and over consuming and uh, fucking up this entire planet and i don't care about the planet actually uh, i hope it will uh, everyone will be burned <laughs> <laughs> this is some very extreme stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this planet uh, can carry on without us. Yeah. Yeah. This is mankind. Uh, you know how uh, old this planet is, or the Earth is about the billions, right? 6.4. That is the, what I was looking for. 6.4. And mankind has been around for well, so many, so long. Well, yeah, 33,000 years. 33. Like, okay. Yeah. This will end mankind. The earth will continue yeah, to Yeah, of exist. course. Yeah. So... You think it will be us doing it? Who Doing what? Ending humanity? Will it be humanity ending humanity? Mm, no, I don't know. It's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, 
maybe uh, there's going to be a, a volcano eruption or massive tsunamis which will kill everyone. Or, or it could be a nuclear war. The, yeah. Uh, I mean, if we're going to, m- to the moon and to Mars, then, you know, we'll make sure that the species humanity will survive to a certain extent. Uh-huh. That's, the, that's the plan, right? To have, like, different locations in the universe that we can, we can spread to so when the Earth fucks it up, we can at least uh, continue being... Is that the plan? I th- I that yeah apparently that's oh, the only yeah. solution to uh, it is the only solution now f- to ensure humanity survival. Yeah, yeah. the Earth will uh, say stop at a certain moment to mankind. This is this enough? Uh, I need to go. Yeah. And, uh, uh, in a way, I I you know I understand that what you say is you know there's there's a lot of hate and a lot of problems that we have and among each other and. But in a way, I've I've always had this idea that we will continue developing to a point that we can coexist balanced enough that we can start spreading outside of the Earth. It, I don't believe that we'll get like this one universal government globally. We'll always have like issues, but because we are humans, we'll, we'll always have issues. But and I don't believe that we'll get to that point where we go into a third world war like situation anytime soon but it's it's an intes- intense idea to, to almost like cognitive pr- to prepare for it mm-hmm. that you know that it can happen at any moment and 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 that you have like a vague idea of what you like it's not a specific plan but you have an idea of where you would want to be like i would yeah okay i i, I always had the idea that like, i want to be able to go to norway the moment that the earth really just, like falls apart Maybe that's why I have a boat. I don't know. <laughs> but it, like, because if you want to get there and they lock down the borders and you can't get there by car, you know, you become so dependent on roads and stuff. The boat enables you to go wherever. Maybe maybe, uh, maybe it's, a, it's a plan. But uh, yeah, it's not a real like... Uh, it's not a, a, a plan based on, on my heritage or something. Not It'd be an time. interesting question to ask yeah. people. Yeah. What, we, what are you going to do? Because now with Corona... You would expect, like everyone who had a plan, that they activated the plan. And I always thought, like, oh, I'll be ready when it happens. Mm. And then when Corona came, I was not ready at all. Yeah, no one was ready uh, at all. Like, like even the preppers, they were like ready for like the zombie apocalypse to come, and it didn't come. I, I found it a bit disappointing actually. Like I was hoping for riots and like people trying to break into other people's houses to like, take the food. Okay, maybe yeah. it's a bit like a, a weird hope to have, but like now I would rather have something as extreme as that than to have the passive, like having to wait that we have now, you know? Uh, maybe for a crisis, it's too civilized the way people Yeah, things react. are way too normal still. Too normal, yeah. Like, it, it'd be nice to have something you can actually put your energy in and fight against because now you've been told to wait, wait, wait. You can't, no, not yet. And you have no agency. There's nothing you can do to, to, to fight against uh, the restrictions because the restrictions are man-made. The so coronavirus yeah. is, you know, th- there's this natural boundary that says, if you do this, get sick, might die, you know? Yeah. That's a fair balance because, then you know, okay, well... Then I don't go and, and meet other people. But then the government goes out and give you other new rules. Then, then they change so continuously. So Yeah. They can I keep a record of uh, all the changes. And so now the people uh, turn themselves to the government. Some yeah, they, they hope that the government will fix it for them. It's a small group. Uh, but uh, yeah things are just still way too normal. Yeah, I know, but in, in my opinion, it would be really good if it was a bit more extreme. I mean, it, of course, you know, you don't want to wish for more dead people, but what you really want is to have the feeling that you are still in a situation where you can do something about yeah. the situation around you. The solution is not doing anything. That, that, that is what the, they That's what us. they say, yeah. That's what they say. Waiting for more vaccines. Um, what what kind of world are we going? Because I feel a bit bitter, you know, about being told to wait. 
because I have plans for my life. And it sounds stupid because there's people who died, you know, who lost family members. Um, uh, and and now, now I'm complaining about, oh, I have my plans for my life. and But at the same time, like, I'm not going to be able to fix that for them, you know. Um, it would be nice to have the ability to make my own decisions and take and calculate my own risks and not have someone tell me, we know what's best for you. Because if I wanted that, I would have gone and, and live in North Korea. No, it sounds too harsh. But <laughs> but no, but it's it it, 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 it borderlines on this situation when you have this political um, these political decisions made for you based on, on what you can achieve in your life. If everything opens up again, of course, you know, there were so many people very happy and celebrative. But I think I'll be quite bitter because it took me so long to get where I'm in my life. You know, the stability you were talking about before. I too had my struggles. Everyone had their struggles. And some people really worked very hard and they lost so much. And then what? You can start over again. There was no ability to fight for this stuff, you know, to, to maintain it because other people decided for you, you weren't allowed to. It happened all of a sudden, and uh, before we knew, uh, the whole world came to a sort of stop or pause. Mm. And it's going to take a long time uh, to build up the world we once had before Corona. Yeah, you think we're going to go back to what it was like? Yeah, maybe mankind uh, is going to face more difficulties now. Um, from uh, things beyond mankind that mm. they've mm. ever experienced before, because uh, the world says stop. Well, I think that the main issue is that we've always been fighting against nature, but now we have such a fragile uh, system that can collapse just because we are unable to maintain certain aspects of it, and we depend on it so strongly emotionally, but also you know mm -hmm. physically that if it falls apart we can't uh we can't get back no but you know what we should do what should we should try and get you back somewhere near in the future yeah yeah and have um, more conversations It'll about what's awesome. going on in your life and what else you're you know you're working on and yeah i'd be very pleased to yeah well thank you so much for having taking the time and sitting down with us and yeah sharing all the stuff that you've been going through and the decisions and changes you've gone through it's Thank you. Fascinating and, and truly um, inspiring. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Art Safari. Art Safari is made possible with the support of the Mondrium Fund, the Municipality of Enschede, Willebank Foundation and Bauerheim Foundation. For more episodes, you can find us on Spotify or visit www.artsafari.show. Or you check out our YouTube channel, where all episodes of Art Safari are available to listen to and to watch. Until the next time.